also, I don't want, I want to make sure we don't get confused. There has been a problem with Hunet that I've mentioned previously about DBase files, about the old DBase files and now the SQLite files. We're trying to get the migration over. Uh, I'm hoping, so right now it's working very well, but there are still issues. So, so, so basically my goal before the end of the August is that DBase files will be 100% compatible again. Right now, that is not the case. Right now, because of the DBase compatibility issues, um, we, use a so we use a software, a Microsoft software called the Microsoft Access Database Engine to use DBase files. And on a lot of computers, because of compatibility issues, that software is not running properly. So reinstalling the Microsoft Access Database Engine usually fixes it, but not always. If it doesn't fix it, you completely manually uninstall all of the Access engines, the, the, this file that I mentioned, you might have two or three versions of it, uninstall Hunet, reinstall everything. So far that always fixes it, at least in the short term, the problem may happen again. So right now we use DBase files through this library from Microsoft called Microsoft Access Database Engine. In January, Microsoft announced that they were temporarily removing support for DBase and they have not brought it back yet. So we have started uh, especially in this one here, this one called uh, Update Data Files to SQLite, we're using DBase files, but not using the Microsoft Access Database Engine. So we are trying to use our DBase files in a way that is not dependent on Microsoft. We did this one because we needed this one to do the upgrade. So eventually, I don't know about my computer right now, I, I, I'm using mostly SQLite, but if I go to Data Analysis, if I go to Data Files, and if I try to open the older version, so I was like, this is the, oh no, that's not it either. Where's the um, Luna data? Let me change this to all files. W0195, I'm looking for a DBase file. Well, here's, here's many, so let me just copy this one. C so drive, um, Luna data, and paste. Let me see if I can open that or not. So I'm going to go to. Um, so I'm, what I'm exploring is a potentially different issue, which is confusing. Uh, if I go to the data folder, and there. So this is an old DBase file. I'm going to try to select that. Okay. And let me just do a simple analysis: percent resistance, def aureus. Okay. I'm going to click on Begin Analysis, and it will either work or it will not work. So on my computer, it is now working. But because of the DBase compatibility issues, what some people get is an error message. What some people get is no isolates found. So both of those things are the DBase compatibility issues. So uh, what you're describing sounds different, but I just want to warn you that sometimes people say the file is gone when the file's not gone, but Hunet is having trouble reading the file. What you have told me is you're not looking inside of Hunet where these compatibility issues would be important. You're looking at my computer, look, you're looking at Windows. So if you're looking at Windows, these compatibility issues are not related. But this might be relevant other times. If, if you click on this button, begin analysis, and it says no isolates found, that could be the DBase compatibility issues because we use the Access Database Engine. By the end of August, I think we can do this without the Access Database Engine. It may or may not be slower, uh, because you know, you know, they were a professional company doing their access engines. We're making our own engine, which will be compatible. It may or may not be slow. I, I, we just don't know yet. I do know that Adam really did optimize the the upgrade to SQLite, so I'm hoping it's going to be as fast. I just cannot say that right now. So again, that's not the virus issue. That's a bit detour on this DBase stuff. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, you, you raised an interesting issue uh, regarding compatibility. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, we are actually installing uh, UNET version uh, 2020 to all yes. phase two sites. Uh, so uh, they are entering the data using uh, not DBase actually, SQL, something like that. SQLite, SQLite, yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, at the end of the day, we are planning to prepare annual report. Uh, so is it possible to combine all this kind of data uh, without any problem? Uh, I will say yes, and then I will give a qualification on that. So when I go to here to data files, 
I can, and I say all files, all files. I can choose all HUNET data files from 1989, from 2000, from 2020. So all of the files for the, the last 30 years should be compatible, and you can uh, and you can combine them. So don't worry about a mixture of DBase and SQLite. The small caveat that I want to mention is because of these DBase compatibility issues, um, right now that will work on some computers, but other computers the DBase won't work, maybe. Uh, but that's temporarily. By the end of August, I think that no computer will have a DBase compatibility issue because we will stop using the Microsoft Access Database Engine. So, so right now what you're saying, you can combine any HUNET files from any of the last 30 years Everything should be fine unless you have the DBase compatibility issue. There are short-term fixes for it, but we should have the long-term fix, <coughs> excuse me, before the end of August. In fact, I think we'll have most of it by the end of next week. I just don't want to overpromise because, you know, sometimes other priorities come up. Okay? So don't worry. Okay, DBase and SQLite, you can mix them together, and there should be zero issues unless you have this part short-term DBase compatibility issue. Okay, great. I keep on mentioning that file. I'm going to go to Google Chrome, Microsoft. Oh, where, how do you spell Microsoft? There is Microsoft Access Database Engine. And, you know, so this is the file. So this file is optimized for Microsoft Access. It is also supposed to do DBase. It's more specifically a technology called DAO. It's supposed to be using it, uh, but that's where Windows, you know, Windows has changed it to temporarily not include DBase files any longer. So uh, this is the file that's causing us trouble. Okay, so I'm going back to the agenda if I can find it. So that's number two. Yes, three points. Put in an antivirus software. That's irrespective of anything. Number two, and also policies about Sometimes what you have to do is there'll be one computer with an antivirus software, so you have to go to that computer to do your USB cleaning before you put it in the other computers. That helps protect the other computers. And also just centralizes the antivirus to one of the computers. Of course, we want antivirus on all the computers, but sometimes you just start on one computer. Um, let's see, that's one point. Viruses, definitely you want a strategy for that. Number two is that you also want a strategy for backups. And if you're having trouble, just make it backups every day into some secure place that you feel comfortable with. Number three, I, the, what you're describing is strange. I'm not exactly sure what's happening there. And I'm not sure that I will have any additional useful input on that. It doesn't seem like a Hunet specific thing, but you know, let me know what you find. Number three. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe uh, let me interrupt you, sorry. Yes. Uh, when uh, I put the Hunet, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the Hunet, uh, all, I mean, when I, I put the Hunet software in D, in drive D, uh, the problem will not be happen. So I just got this one through troubleshooting. When I put it in the D, not in the C, you know, by default, Hunet will be placed under C. So when I make it in D, the problem will, you know, will disappear. So if you get some idea from this, maybe, yeah. you may say something. Uh, so let me see, um, you know, I don't think, I'm gonna show you something that's useful, but I don't think it's directly related. I'm here under Hunet, I'm going to file. At the bottom, there's an option called configuration. I'm gonna click on the word configuration. And here you see the default locations. So by default, the data will go onto the C drive, but you yeah. can browse and you can put the you can put the data on one of the other network drives. Okay. So uh, there are two different questions: where is the HuNet software, and where are the HuNet data files or the HuNet program files, or well, not the program files, the HuNet configuration files and data files. So the, when you install Hunet, so I'm going to go to my installation here, this PC, users, downloads. So here, um, it's not going to work right now because I've already updated my software. But now it's started the installation software. So when you install Hunet, it does ask you, what folder do you want to install to? Do you want to install yeah. to this 
drive, who not, who not, or the P drive. Here, it's simply saying set up failed. There's no error here. This version of the software is already present, so there's no need to yeah. reinstall it. But normally, one of the first questions is where do you want to install it? So that's the location of the software. The second question is where are the data files? The default location will be wherever you put the software, C drive, D drive, F drive, in the data subfolder. If you want to change that, then you can put it someplace else. Okay, so that might be useful yeah. for you as well. I don't think it would explain the problem, but that could be helpful if you want the data over here, but you want the software over here. Okay, um, I just received an email from Ethiopia. I think we probably all did. I just want to make sure he's thanking somebody. Okay, he got it. Okay, um, good. That's. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it, it might be a, a virus, but it might be a defect in the C drive. You know, the, the C drives can, any drive can be corrupted, lost sectors, invalid memory. So sometimes reformatting the hard drive is enough to fix that. It would also get rid of viruses in the short term. Um, it'd be strange that it'd be only Hunet, but you know, if that's what you're seeing, that's what you're seeing. <clears throat> Maybe they're not using the other softwares as much. I, I, uh, uh, well, did you say you you said you put the data files on the D drive? Did you also put the software on the D drive? No, no, the software, the software itself. The software itself. Because, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are things about protections, but usually it doesn't delete things. It just tells you you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot do this. Talk to your IT department. Those are permissions issues. Um, I have seen like in my hospital network, you know, we do have things on our H drive, and sometimes I turn the computer on. And there are new icons there that the hospital installs automatically. So sometimes there are issues like that, which there's some central control over your computer. But that would be unlikely, but it's something to consider. Okay, great. Uh, but thanks for debugging. It's nice if something works on the D drive, but not on the C drive, that is what you need. You have a working software. It would also be nice to have an explanation for the problem, but sometimes we cannot end up, we cannot find the explanation, which is unfortunate. The two situations, it's working and you know why, and it's working and you don't know why. You'd rather it yeah. be the first situation. If it works and you don't know why, oh, it's still okay, but it just makes you a little wondering what's going on here. Uh, the worst one is, well, then there's things are not working and you know why, at least you know what you have to do. And it's not working and you don't know why, that's hard. Um, is it all, if it happens always, that's easier. Uh, if it happens once in a while and it's unpredictable, that's frustrating because it can be hard to fix and hard to understand. We're going to move on to the on the agenda. We did number two. I'm saving number one for last because it's very open ended. You know, it can we we have a lot of time. We can do a lot of things with number one. Number two, we finished that. Number three, fixing error messages. Are there specific error messages that you have in mind? I already wrote. Well, the answer is depends on the, what the message is. If it's an error because of something you did, then you need to understand what you did. If it's an error because of uh, an error in Hunet, you cannot fix that. You can tell us, we can say it's already been fixed, please download the new software. We can tell you that we can explain why it is. We can say, oh, we were not aware of that. We'll go ahead and fix it. Um, or it might be a compatibility issue. It's, it's There's nothing exactly wrong with Hunet, and there's nothing exactly wrong with your data. But there's a problem of compatibility that Hunet cannot do what it's supposed to do. And that's the main reason for that right now are these DBase issues that we're trying to trying to have a complete solution, a, part, a mostly partial solution at the end of next week, and a complete solution by the end of August. So uh, that's all I'll say right now. But now my question for you is, do you have specific errors in mind? Are there any screens or error messages you would like to show to me? Yeah, so maybe let me. Off on the my agenda, I wonder what they had in mind. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to open my Hunet, then I will tell you. Uh, okay. Share course, your screen. Uh, okay, I have stopped sharing my screen. Zilalem is a presenter. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah. 
Some general, well, you do that, some general comments. One thing I always wonder, is it a reproducible error or is it just infrequently? Reproducible uh, errors are easier to explore. Go ahead, yes. Yeah, uh, you know, while I'm doing some kind of data analysis, uh, not always, sometimes I will get error number something like that. Uh, 72 or any other error number, uh, yeah, will come. Uh, so what I can do, I will use another computer to do that kind of an specific kind of analysis. Uh, that, in well, that right, way, right. I will. Yeah. Error message, you should let me know <laughs> because we want to fix it and we want to understand it. So some of the questions I always have is this: is this a one-time error, or is it reproducible easily, or is it just infrequently for unexplained reasons? So those are three kinds of issues: one time only, all all the time versus once in a while. The next question, is it just this computer or is it other computers? In which case you think about compatibility issues, you think about the version of Hunet. Um, okay, is that, this is a DBase file, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, click on okay. Yeah. No, 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 I want to stay on the DBase file. Does that DBase which file one? have data? Yeah, it is DBase, yeah. Click on okay, click on begin analysis. Now it works. In this case, it works. Right. In this good. case, it works. Yeah, it works. Yes, and that's kind of good when it works, but you want it to work always reliably. You did analysis previously with a different data file, and it said no isolates found, and I was wondering about that, because that would be that would be the DBase compatibility issue, which does not. The DBase compatibility issue usually gives an error message. Sometimes it does not give an error message and it simply says no isolates found. And we're hoping to have that particular issue fixed by the end of next week. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Um, Maybe I have seen from your computer some error number. Right, and it just depends on what the error number is, what the error, so, so, uh, so do you, I think we've discussed previously how to do a screen grab, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just as a reminder for people, a lot of times people tell me what they are seeing, but I would rather see what they are seeing. And you just do a screen grab. The quickest and easiest way to make a screen grab is to look at your keyboard. And on your keyboard, on your computer keyboard, there's a key called print screen. So if you click on print screen, I wish they would change the name of that key because it does not print the screen it copies the screen. So they should just rename that, that key, copy screen. Because then you could just copy screen and paste it into an email, paste it into a Word document, paste it into a PowerPoint. Um, that's one way. There are other ways. There's alt print, print screen does the whole screen. Alt print screen just does the active window. Or Windows has this thing called the snipping tool, um, uh, the slipping or snipping clip tool. Um, so that's these are different ways to make screen grabs. So that's one thing that I can, you, then I will see exactly what you're seeing. Can you now go to your, well, usually, you, you have not had a, an error on this particular computer before? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a desktop. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm before, getting, yeah. Before that, go back into your Hunet folder. Go back into your yeah, Hunet this folder. folder. Yes, yeah. whenever, you, whenever Hunet generates an error message on the screen, it also generates an error log. So yeah, yeah. instead of sending me the screen, you can just send me the error log. Uh, so here you have nothing in alphabetical order called, no, no, it's not in the log folder, it's in the main folder. We use the log folder for a different kind of log. So in this folder, there will be something called error log. Uh, so yeah, if you send yeah. the error log, that tells me the error number, the error message, the error routine, uh, and it tells me the version of Hunet that you are using, 
it tells me the laboratory configuration. So it gives us good information for us to start understanding what is happening. If you're doing a data analysis, it also saves a version of the macro to help us reproduce what you were doing. So in a general okay. sense, these are my general questions, but if you have specific errors, we need to see the details of the specific errors. So there are no error logs here, therefore we have not had an error on this particular computer. Uh, okay, would you like to show anything else about the error messages using the other computer or, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned error 72. Can you go to Google right now? Can you go to the internet? Yeah. Uh, and do a, an internet search. And just search for error, you said error 72? So yeah, just search yeah, for error 72 Visual Studio. Error 72, error 72, face Visual Studio. Visual? Visual Studio, that's it. So, uh, and then just do a search on that. Sometimes the error message are very helpful. Sometimes they're very generic. Um, mm -hmm. Are you sure it was error 72? Yeah, it's, yeah, 72, we, uh, yeah, I had 72, and also I had error number five. Yeah, error number five is common. Can, I don't see error 72 here. Can you go down, can you just change error 72 to error five? Error five is one of the more common ones. Error five. Right, so, so basically you see that first one is from Microsoft. And then you'll see you'll see answers from Microsoft. You'll see errors from other people. Some of these error messages are very specific and very helpful. Some of these error messages are kind of vague. So uh, um, so this is what I do. Uh, sometimes I know what the problem is or I have a good idea what the problem is. Other times we really don't know, so we just search Google to see who else has had this problem. So the next time you see an error message, please copy screen and or send me the error log. I will try to reproduce it. If I can reproduce it on my computer, great. Then we then that's all I need. We can fix it using our computers. If I cannot reproduce it on my computers, then what we will often do is set up an online session where I can see your computer so that we can work through it together. That allows us to try this, try that, explore it. Um, uh, so these are so so the the question was what do we do about error messages? It depends on what the error message is, and these are some of the things that help us to understand. So it's two steps. Step one is the diagnosis: what is the problem? And secondly, once you have the diagnosis, uh, what is the resolution? And a good place to start is just re-download the current version of Hunet because we're always fixing things. So sometimes the errors that you found find have already been fixed. Okay. okay, any other questions about error messages? So please send to me the details of the error messages that you are seeing, and then I can tell you whether or not I know what the problem is and what we can try to do about it. Okay, okay. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as the network drive is down. You ask for a file on the T drive, and the T drive is not accessible. What we try to do is we try to give the, the user not an error message. We try to give them a warning. We would like to say, oh, the T drive is not accessible. That is a warning. Um, uh, but sometimes, depending on what they did, it will get an error message. So error does not necessarily mean something's wrong. It means sometimes, you know, uh, you know that, that there's some simple explanation, which is not an error. It's just not possible right now. Um, and sometimes people say there's an error, and there isn't an error, it's simply a warning. You know, sometimes they'll say, I want to see isolates that are female, uh, female isolates, you're an outpatient, and they find no isolates. And they say, John, who says no isolates? And then when we look into it, they didn't have any female urine outpatients. <laughs> that's not an error, that's just a helpful warning or a helpful comment on what you were seeing. So I try to distinguish between normal behavior, 
warnings and errors. Okay. Um, if no more questions on that, I'd like to move on to the antibiograms. Again, the antibiograms is very specific. And then after the antibiograms, we can go back to number one, data cleaning, you know, because we could spend five minutes in that or five hours on that. If nothing else, I'm going to move on to the antibiograms. So can you make me the presenter again? Yes, you should be presenter now, John. Great, share screen. So I hope you can see my data analysis screen. I'm going to go to analysis type. Okay, so here under our, uh, so I'm going back to the agenda. The question was, how can we do an antibiogram? I want to distinguish between, so that's percent resistance or percent sense, sense summary. We have two versions of the, this analysis. We have number one, the detailed version, percent R, percent I, percent S, the breakpoints, the zone diameters, the MIC distributions. So number one is the detailed report for RIS. Number two is the summary report. The summary report is usually what people call the antibiogram. It's like once a year, you want to prepare a nice summary report. If you want to tell them all the details, then do the first option, the detailed report. If you just want to give them the high level summary, then do the second report called the summary. If I do the detailed report, I will get percent R, percent I, percent S. The summary report, it will only tell me, if I look over to the right side of the screen, it will tell me the percent susceptible alone. Or it will tell me the percent resistant, or the percent non-susceptible, or the percent non-resistant. So that's just a question of personal preference. If you want to see the R, the I, and the S, then do number one, the detailed report. But if you don't want to see everything, do the summary report. So that's our antibiogram. By tradition, microbiologists, not microbiologists, by tradition, physicians and pharmacy people like to see the percent susceptible because they want a drug for clinical therapy with good efficacy. They want a drug that's 90% susceptible, 95% susceptible, 98% susceptible. So the traditionally pharmacy people and infectious disease clinicians usually want to see percent susceptible. On the other hand, microbiologists and epidemiologists often like to see the percent resistant. They want to say, oh, it's 3% resistant, 10% resistant. Uh, they're basically the same thing, except for the intermediate range. What are you going to do with the intermediates? Well, with percent susceptible, you ignore the intermediate, so you just get the 2% susceptible. The problem is if you look at percent resistant by itself, you're ignoring the intermediates, and the intermediates are usually not something the, the antibiotics with intermediate activity, usually you don't want to treat a patient with that. Uh, so that's why we usually do non-susceptible. So if I'm doing emerging resistance, I want to see my percent R plus my percent I. So that's what we have in this context, percent non-susceptible. So the first option, percent susceptible. That's usually what the clinicians and the pharmacy people want. Percent resistant or percent non-susceptible, uh, depending on personal preference and what you, why you were doing the analysis, for whom, uh, they often percent, prefer percent resistant, percent intermediate, non-susceptible, by the epidemiologist or the, the microbiologist interested in emerging resistance. It's easier to talk about resistance going from 1 to 20 percent than susceptibility going from 99 down to 80 percent. So it's just a question of the message that you want to convey. So for traditional normal antibiograms, we normally do percent susceptible. But if your interest is in emerging CRE, carbapenem resistance, for that purpose, instead, people will often look at emerging non-susceptibility or emerging resistance. Personal preference, up to you. More traditional is percent susceptible because a lot of times we do want to use these for treatment recommendations. So you want a drug with a high percent susceptible. Here at the bottom of the screen, I can do all of the antibiotics or just certain antibiotics. Oops. I can do, you see lower left, select antibiotics or all antibiotics. The first time I do this, I'm going to do all antibiotics. But in Ethiopia, you know, you might have 40 different antibiotics tested by somebody, and you might not be interested in all 40. For example, if one or two of your laboratories tested daptomycin and linezolid 
but the other laboratories don't. Uh, I personally do want to know the daptomycin linezolid results, but I don't want to put them into my annual report for everybody because only one or two facilities selected it. So the first time I do this analysis, I will do all of the antibiotics, but then after that, I'm going to repeat it, and I'm going to just put the antibiotics, the most important core interesting antibiotics that I want to include in my annual report. So maybe I test, maybe my country tests 40 different antibiotics, but in my annual report, I want to include the 12 antibiotics that everybody is testing and everybody agrees on. So in short, we're gonna start by doing all the antibiotics, and then we will come back and just filter it on just a subset. If no questions, so right now I'm gonna do percent susceptible summary, percent susceptible, all antibiotics. Later, we will come back and look at select antibiotics. Later, we will say, well, I want to do this for the whole country. That's what it is doing right now. Or I can do this separately by lab. Or I can separately do this for male, female. Or I can do this separately for different locations or location types or specimen types. So by using the row variables, I can do a stratified antibiogram. I will do that, but not yet. I'm doing the simple percent susceptible summary, all antibiotics, all labs in one big antibiogram. I'm going to click on OK. Organisms. Let me just do a few of the gram negatives E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Pseudomonas. Okay, and Acinetobacter. So those are some of my five important antibiotics. I'm going to click on OK. I'm going to click on data files. And I'm gonna look for your data files, and there they are. Let me choose all four of them. Let me choose the first two. Let me choose the second two. Okay. Any questions so far? And you don't have to unmute yourself. Uh, you know, I'll just wait two, three seconds. It seems like no questions. So let me go back to analysis type. And I said we have the detailed report and we have the summary report. I will show you the difference by showing you the detailed report report first. When I do the detailed report and I click on begin analysis, first, uh, oh, why is it good? so these are my dbase SQLite. These are dbase files or SQLite files? Um, that's the, those are the annoying things I was mentioning. Um, but I did this earlier today and it worked fine. Um, in fact, I did it even during this call, and it worked fine at the beginning. Let me go to users, downloads, and access database. So I'm just going to install the Microsoft Access Database Engine to show how easy it is to do. It is annoying. Uh, oh, and now it's got 32-bit, 64-bit. I just tried to install. I need the other version of this, the 64-bit version, which I currently do not have installed. Uh, I'm looking forward to taking care of this. So Microsoft Access Database Engine, Microsoft Access Database Engine, and I go to download. And this time I'm doing the 64-bit version. And it is now downloading. Download now. It's already downloading. Um, sorry for this. It's just extremely annoying. I'm hoping that these DBase, these critical DBase issues resolved by the end of next week, and all the DBase issues resolved before the end of August. Um, fortunately, and we learned about these issues in February, and we took advantage of the time to make the SQLite option. Um, and fortunately, we had no other huge priorities, so we were able to dedicate the time to that. Open. So I am now installing the 64-bit version. The problem is that you know if, if you have 32-bit and 64-bit, it just gets confused. So sometimes that's why we have to uninstall things first. Okay, I just have to close my office first. And what else do I have to close? And I have to close Hunat. That's fine. Exit, exit, exit. And close my Hunat. Close my Hunat. And where's that? Oh, I guess it's. Mm -hmm. There it is. Now responding. And task. And Hunat and task. Good, good. And retry. And Microsoft. Um, hmm. Oh, okay, just wanted me to close one more software. Um, so we can always solve this, but as you can see, it, it, it's just inconvenient. 
Um, Microsoft Access, I have to close this one as well. And task, close this and retry. Uh, let me just close uh, from some of these things I don't need. Close this folder, close this folder, close that folder. And good. It's trying to install it, it's just a bit slow. And I, well, that when I think open, it's now almost finished. Okay, and okay, and exit. Okay, let me see whether or not that fixes this issue. And I go back to Ethiopia all, whoops, I clicked the open one, I clicked the wrong one. All data files, analysis type, percent resistance, E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, and, and Acinetobacter. Okay, data files, star encrypt, and let me change this, select the first two. And I see that Rodney has just arrived. Rodney, welcome. And begin analysis. Good. So it does work. So we, we can't fix this issue, but it's just inconvenient, as you can see. Um, great. Was there a comment or a question? Uh, maybe what kind of solution, uh, uh, Man, what kind of problem you experienced? What was the solution? So just to summarize. Right. So, so basically, I hope that within two weeks, the specific issue that we just had will be completely resolved. And then by the end of August, all such issues, like right now we analyze data files here, but we analyze data files and data entry, combine, export, encrypt. So at least for data analysis, I hope to have that fixed by the end of next week. So the issue is that I ran the analysis and it said no isolates found. And the reason that it said no isolates found is that it saw the files, but it was not able to read the files appropriately. Therefore, I reinstalled the Microsoft Access Database Engine. After reinstalling the Microsoft Access Database Engine, it's now working perfectly. But it might work perfectly for five minutes or five weeks. So the fix that I just made is sort of a short-term fix until the problem happens again. These problems continue to happen because Microsoft continues to try to update it and the updated version does not reliably support DBase. So that's a technical answer, but in short, I know exactly what the problem is. And I'm hoping by the end of next week, we can finally, so in the course of the last several months, we made a SQLite as an alternative option. So SQLite should avoid these issues, but we still have the DBase files. So the DBase, we need the access engine to work, but next week we will start to remove the access engine completely and that should be a permanent fix for this problem. Okay, good. So getting back to why, we, we're talking about the subject of antibiograms. So let's get back on track to our antibiograms. Um, uh, so antibiograms, I have now asked for the detailed report, that number one, detailed report for five different organisms, E. coli, Klebsiella. I chose four files that begin the analysis, and you see the DBase problem is back again. <laughs> So it just happened one moment to the next. Let me, you know, I think sometimes what happens, let me just close Hunet and go back again. So sometimes just restarting Hunet is enough to quote unquote fix it. It's not a long-term fix, obviously, uh, but let me just uh, go to, I do have to close my Hunet, where's my, oh, I'm sorry, it's at the top of the screen. Hunet, close. Okay. So if I simply close Hunet and go back into Hunet, sometimes that's enough to clean this issue. So data analysis, percent resistance, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter. If I go to data files, I choose my four encrypted ones. I choose those two, I choose these two. I'm ignoring the one in the middle because that's the one from last week. So we're back on track, it is working again. So in this particular case, leaving Hunet, restarting Hunet was enough to quote unquote fix the issue. But you can see how annoying this is. And I hope by the end of next week, these annoying issues will be completely fixed for DBase for the priority area of data analysis and data entry. And then by the end of August for all the other areas of Hunet as well. So back on track, this is the detailed report for E. coli. I click on continue. This is the detailed report for Klebsiella, continue. The detailed report for Enterobacter, continue. Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. By a detailed report, I see my breakpoints, human, animal, 
uh, number of isolates, R, I, S, confidence intervals, six millimeters, seven millimeters. I see my, my histograms for zone diameters, for MIC. So this is the detailed report. It has a lot of information. Continue. I am now going to change this to the summary report, and I hope that it works. Click on Begin Analysis. So now instead of having five separate pages, I have all the organisms on the same page. Uh, so that's the difference, is that it's less detail, but there are more organisms on the same page. So instead of having one page for each bacteria, I have one row for each bacteria. And I see at the top, alphabetical order, Acinetobacter, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella pseudomonas. So I see the percent sensitive on the left, because that's what I requested. And then on the right, I see the denominators. The denominators are very important. I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But here you see that for Klebsiella pneumonia, they tested ciprofloxacin 257 times. But Dory Penham, they only tested eight times. So that's very important, I believe, the results, because it's a lot of data. But Dory Penham, they only tested eight times. Cefoxetin, they only tested three times. So these denominators are very important, but I'm going to come back to that in a few moments. So if I look at the graphs, this is the graph for Acinetobacter, the graph for Enterobacter cloacae, E. coli, which is relatively susceptible, Acinetobacter relatively resistant. So if I compare E. coli and Klebsiella, E. coli is usually more sensitive, and that's what I see here. E. coli, we have a lot of antibiotics, like 90% sensitive, 80% sensitive. Klebsiella, we have a fewer number. Like if, I, if let me look at E. coli, if I look at above 90% sensitive, no, let me look at above 80% sensitive. I have my amication. Doripenem, uh, gentamicin, imipenem, meropenem, uh, nitrofurantoin. So we have several drugs that have over 80% sensitive. Pepsiella, I only have three. Amicacin, imipenem, and norfloxacin. And ertapenem is close. Ertapenem is, well, ertapenem is right around 80%. So that's, this is, again, what I'm expecting, that Klebsiella is usually somewhat more resistant than E. coli. Part of it is its natural resistance. Let me look at the, uh, okay. Klebsiella, you see, is 0% sensitive, which is normal. You know, maybe 2% maybe sensitive, 3% sensitive is normal for Klebsiella. Pseudomonas, and then I can look at a particular drug. You know, for example, let me look like imipenem. So imipenem, very sensitive for E. coli, Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas, but not very sensitive for Enterobacter cloacae, which is normal. Enterobacter cloacae is at higher risk of, uh, of having imipenem resistance. Uh, part of that are specific carbapenemases, part of the lactamases that they also have. So again, this is matching sort of my expectation. I'm very happy with how sensitive your imipenems are for E. coli and Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. Um, okay, any questions on this table right now? Yeah, maybe a okay. uh, question. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, is it possible to compare uh, drugs or antibiotics with respect to uh, specific microorganisms? For example, impenum and uh, another, uh, maybe tefoxity. Uh, so impenum, we know that it is more uh, strong drug than uh, tefoxity. Uh, is there any possibility of getting uh, resistance for impenum susceptible for cefoxidin? Yes, there are many ways to answer that question. So let me come back to that. The answer to your question is yes. And I'll come back to that after I talk a bit more about these antibiograms. Okay. So what else do I want to do with an antibiogram? Well, one of the first things I want to do is I want to copy the table over to Excel. So I'm now opening Excel. I'm trying to open Excel. My mouse isn't working, by the way, so that happens on my computer. So I'm hitting the Excel button. Let me just try Excel. Oh, okay, here it's coming. It was just slow. Okay, blank workbook. And I do paste. So here we have everything in Excel. What you definitely should not do is print this out and give this to your doctors immediately. 
you only give it to the doctors if you trust the results. Uh, so, okay. So the typical antibiogram, I'm going to, so what I would often do right now is I'd often save this as version one. And then I'm going to start deleting things to make version two, version three, version four, until I finally have my final, final, final version. For example, I mentioned here that there were 482 E. coli. That's the total number of isolates for E. coli. But how many times did they test E. coli for each drug? I'm going to go to the right, 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 go to the right. And they tested, uh, okay, let me go back to the left. There's a thing called freeze. I'm just going to freeze it. So if I go to the right, I can still see my total. So there are 482 E. coli. As I move to the right and I look at my denominators, I can see they tested amicacin 284 times. That's over half. They had azithromycin once, probably a typing mistake. Sufoxidin six times. So sufoxidin is certainly a valid drug, but it's a valid drug, but they still didn't test it very often. Ceftazidine, they tested 211 times. So I want to get rid of drugs that are not tested. I can either delete them or hide them. But for example, azithromycin is 0% sensitive, but they only tested it once. So it's not meaningful. So certain, some of these drugs are just incorrect drugs, like azithromycin is not really appropriate for an E. coli. I'm going to delete the azithromycin for sense sensitive. I'm going to delete drugs that are completely inappropriate. For example, gentamicin high, gentamicin normal, that's good for E. coli. Gentamicin high is for enterococcus. That's not a valid test. And again, there's an, a quality issue. Did they do that on purpose? Did, was it a typing mistake? Penicillin, invalid. I'm going to delete those. Uh, cephalotaxine. So I deleted those because those are invalid drugs. Okay. And there are other drugs that I might not be so interested in. For example, let me see, like azithromycin, well, I'm getting rid of the azithromycin because it's not an appropriate drug. I'm going to delete the, uh, the, the genomycin high. It was only one. It's probably just a typing mistake. Um, look here at the imipenem. Imipenem is a perfectly appropriate drug, but they're not testing it. They tested it once. They tested it twice. They tested it once. What they are testing is meripenem. So I'm going to go back to the left. And if I look at the imipenem statistics, you see it's either 50% or 100% sensitive. 100% sensitive sounds great, but they only tested it once or twice. So it's not very impressive. On the other hand, the meripenem has real data. So I'm deleting the imipenem because the denominator is so small. Uh, I'm, the cephalothin, it is valid. The cefoxidin, they're, they're valid tests, but they're not testing it very often. So let me delete the cefotaxime. Let me delete the cephalothin. Let me delete the doxycycline. Um, the doripenem, it's valid, but they very rarely test it. Doxycycline or dipenem, it is valid, but they very rarely test it. And th that's, that's why it's so important, like erdipenem, 86% sensitive sounds great. Well, it's not great. It's interpenem resistance 86% sensitive. It's okay, but it's a tiny number of isolates. Therefore, I'm going to remove this number, the, the antibiotic, because there's just not enough data there. I hope that makes sense, because I don't want you telling the doctor's results if, the res if that antibiotic was only tested once or twice. So I'm cleaning this list up to only put antibiotics with good numbers. Does that make sense, I hope? I'm just going to do cut and paste. Um, what I do at the top, I'm going to put it at the bottom here. Of course, now I have to deal with the fact that I deleted different antibiotics on the top and the bottom. Let me get rid of the, uh, I'm getting rid of the cefoxidin on the top. I'm just lining these things up. So um, let me get rid of the doripenem on the top. Oops. Oh, and the Cipro. Uh, oh, no, not the Cipro. That, that's right. Uh, imipenem, let me get rid of the imipenem on the bottom. And let me get rid of, oh, that's fine. A different Pip, T, so penicillin is completely invalid. So good. Now, now, now my things line up. So here. So the my teaching point for right now is like here at cephalothin. So it's nice having them right on top of each other because it's easy for me to see what's going on. 
So here you see there were the amication was 40% sensitive, but it was only five isolates. The minimum recommended is 30. So I'm going to delete five from below, 40 from above, eight from below, 100 from above, 16, 15, five. Well, first of all, ask Enterbacter. There are only 28 of them. So I might even delete that organism because I, I, also 30 is not a magic number. 28 is close enough. But you know, here I only have five. So there's certain organisms that there might not be sufficient data. In this example, I'm going to delete my Enterbacter cloacae because it's under the magic number 30. Of course, in reality, as long as it's above 20, you know, it's still valuable. Um, and also, I'm going to get rid of the Asinita vector because there are only 15 of those. For these three organisms, I have plenty of data. But look here, they, they have 74 pseudomonases, but they only tested AMC eight times. So, and AMP nine times. So let me delete that, delete that below, delete, delete above. They only tested, so I'm just, I'm deleting below anything which is very small. How small is up to you? I'm going to delete um, you know, norfloxacin. I'm going to delete norfloxacin completely because they very rarely test it. Dialadixic acid, it's also going to delete it. It's, these are just small numbers. And here you see for the pseudomonas, there are a lot of drugs I'm going to get rid of because they just do not test them very often. Uh, delete below, delete above. 100%, but they only tested it one time. Um, yeah, 10, they tested it 10 times, 50%. So uh, I would go through further and clean this up more, but this is reasonable. Uh, let, let me get rid of the 28 and the 23 and the 44. Okay. I'm going to delete anything which is below 30. But you have to use a judgment call because sometimes it's still an interesting drug and I don't want to lose it. So you want to keep certain things, and it's just a compromise between what's realistic and what's unreliable. Okay. So this is giving a better idea of the, the, the final antibiogram. Also, some of these drugs I'm really not that interested in, like cefuroxime. You know, a lot of people are not using it. Chloramphenicol, we do not use that drug very much in the United States. So then I can clean this up further, just put in the drugs that I want, like piperacillin by itself. It's really not used very much anymore, at least in the United States. We use the combination, piperacil and tazobactam. So again, I'm just deleting drugs that I do not want to put into my antibiogram. Here I see ceftriaxone, and here I see cefotaxime. The two drugs are almost equivalent. Uh, I'm going to delete these columns. I'm going to hide these columns in the middle. I didn't delete them. These two drugs are almost the same, but as you can see, the eco more, more people test ceftriaxone then they do cefotaxime. So I'm going to delete the cefotaxime. And if you look at the percent resistances, well, they're usually more similar than this, but number, the denominators are different. So I'm going to delete the cefotaxime uh, until finally you get the subset of antibiotics that you want to include in your annual report. OK. Any questions on that? But basically, the doctors are not expecting you know, we started off with a list of about 40 antibiotics. We, they don't want to see 40. They want to see the drugs of greatest epidemiological interest, the greatest clinical interest. So I have deleted antibiotics that I do not have a lot of interest in. And that should match the drugs that are recommended for testing. Once I have that list, I can then come back to HUNET. I can go to analysis type. And for future reference, I can say, I can put immediately here, I want the amication, I want the ampicillin, I want the cefut, I want the, um, which one, the ceftriaxone, where is it, ceftriaxone. I, want, I don't want the imipenem because I want the imeripenem. They're not testing imipenem very much. I want the gentamicin and I want the tobermycin and, uh, uh, and cipro, so. As you can see, I am not asking for all of the drugs. I'm just asking for the drugs that I plan to include in my report. I click OK. I click on Begin Analysis. And I'm going to copy paste that to Excel. And now you can see this is a lot cleaner. It's only the drugs. Let me just move these down below. Okay, Moving that down below. 
I'm moving that down below. The doctors do not want to see the denominators. So I delete this before I give it to the doctors. But as the data analyst, I want to see those. So now that I have a short, so this is a lot cleaner. I don't have a, I don't have completely irrelevant drugs. I can just focus on the drugs I have greatest interest in. And then I can repeat, I see the acinetobacter is only 15, not enough, let me get rid of it. Acinetobacter, let me get rid of it. Enterobacter, 28, it's close enough to 30. And I have 26 meropenems, that's great, but I only have seven ceftriaxones. So I'll start going through, and they only have eight amicacins. The pseudomonas, they just have nine and two. So I get rid of these two numbers. So this feature in HUNET for doing select antibiotics is helpful for the national report, just so you don't have to look at a lot of antibiotics that you really don't have any intention to include in the annual report. Any questions on that? Okay, good. I'm now gonna save this as a macro. So this is repeating what we've done earlier for macros. I'm gonna click on macro. I'm gonna click on new. I'm going to say, this is my gram negative antibiogram. Save, save. Why did I do that? I did that because if I ever want to come back again, I just go back to my macros, I look for gram-negative antibiogram, and it remembers which antibiotics and which organisms. Oh, and I didn't remember the data files. Oh, that's a bug. Uh, but, um, oh, I think I know why. I think, I think we have that issue again that it doesn't understand my data. Let me try that. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was suspecting. So I just need to re- I just need- well, okay, as I said, if I just leave HUNET, I think if I just leave HUNET, it's going to temporarily fix that issue. Um, fortunately, most people do not have this problem as often as I do. Um, so I'm glad that most issues do. But that's why in our side, it's so important for us to resolve these issues quickly. I'm just going to reopen HUNET, and hopefully this time it will work. And data analysis, oh, not quick enough. Data analysis, data analysis, macros, gram negative load. This time it worked. I just had to leave Hunet and go back in, and the second time it worked. Okay, great. So you see the macros are so valuable because sometimes I don't remember which organisms I selected. I don't remember which antibiotics I selected. Or even if I did remember, it's still a pain in the neck to have to type them and copy them in again in precisely the same order so you get exactly the same results. That's another teaching point. Everything you do that you like, that you plan to repeat in the future, just save it as a macro. It will just save you a lot of time and effort. Okay. There's one additional thing, very important, that I did not do, is reme remove repeat isolates. If you have 10 E. coli from the same person, that is a sick person. But I only want to count that sick person once, because otherwise that one person who is often an ICU person, is going to be overall statistics. How do I remove the repeat isolates? I click over here on the right where it says one per patient. HUNET has many options for defining one per patient. I can do all the isolates, that's the first approach. I can do by patient, that is what I'll do. Or I can do the first isolate per year, or the first isolate per three months or the first MRSA and the first MSSA. So the variety of approaches by, re what do I mean by a repeat isolate? Well, different people mean different things. So who knows we give different definitions. The CLSI has a very specific recommendation. Take the first, take, do it by patient. Every patient is equal. In terms of annual statistics, count everybody once. Do not count the ICU patient several times. Do not count the treatment value several times. Count every individual once. I can take their first isolate. I can take the first isolate with antibiotic results. I can take the most susceptible one. I can take the most resistant one. There are other useful options. I'm going to either do first isolate only or first isolate with antibiotic results. Because, of course, just because the patient has a staph aureus in the lab, the lab does not always susceptibility test everything. So I'm going to choose the second option here, first isolate with antibiotic results. Let me click OK, and let me click on Begin Analysis. And again, it's, it's giving me that error. 
So very simple. I just need to leave Hunet. And on my computer, I have to cancel out of it in this way because my computer is funny. And I click on end task and I do that. I go back into Hunet and I think this time it will work. And I go to Ethiopia All Hospitals and I go to data analysis and go to, uh, and I go to my macros. <laughs> I didn't do that right. I go to my macros, gram negative, load. It works fine. I do one per patient, I do by patient, I do first isolate with antibiotic results, okay, begin the analysis. Now when I do it, the numbers will be slightly different. The number of E. coli before was, I don't remember. So it was 482 isolates of E. coli. Well, those 482 isolates came from 443 people. So there were about 40 people who had E. coli twice. Of course, I'm assuming that we have some meaningful patient identifier, you know, so that HUNET can do its counting. So if we, the first time I did this, I found 482 isolates, but the 482 isolates came from 40, 40, 443 different people. So there are about 40 people that had two or three E. coli. This number in front of you is more meaningful. Well, first, the numbers are going to be very similar. You know, on this screen, I see it was amicacin 95.3% sensitive. And previously it was, well, I, I, um, 95.8. So it was 95.8 sensitive and now it's 95.3. So it didn't make a big difference, but it made a difference. It just was not a big difference. You tend to see big differences for something like um, Acinetobacter and, and Pseudomonas because you have a lot of repeats in the hospital setting, at least in my hospital. Let me see if I see an example of that here. Um, I've already deleted the acinetobacter. So here we had 74 isolates of Pseudomonas. Those 74 isolates came from 67 people. So there's certain organisms that have more repeats than other organisms. Like if somebody has Neisseria meningitidis, I hope they just have it once. Gonorrhea, I hope they just have it once. But Pseudomonas, they might have it every day for a couple of weeks. Um, so removing repeat isolates is very important for some pathogens, and we always recommend doing it. For some pathogens, it doesn't make a big difference just because there's so few repeats. Okay, good. And now I can make a new macro. I'll go to new macro and I can say, you know, I'm just going to replace this one, new gram negative antibiogram, because in an antibiogram, you are supposed to remove the repeats. Save, save, repeat, uh, replace, yes. Good. So I'm going to click and begin analysis. So great. Uh, there are two more things I want to show you with antibiograms. I see it's almost nine o'clock, so we still have time. So two more things about antibiograms. One is I showed you how to copy the table. Instead of copying the table, I am now going to save the table. And let me call this gram negative antibiogram Excel. I click on save. It is now saving the Excel file. I don't know where my mouse went because anyway, my mouse isn't working. So do you want to, it's now in Excel. Do you want to open the file now? Yes, I do. And then I go to Excel. Not that, there it is, it just finished. So what you see here are exactly the same data. I didn't, I, all, but what I did before is I copied in and I pasted the data. By saving it as Excel, it's exactly the same data. But there are some advantages. Number one, it's prettier, it looks nicer. It's got the bold and the yellow and the lines. That's one advantage. Advantage number two, it has a heading. It actually has all those details that were not in copy paste. It tells me which organisms, which data files, one per patient. It tells you the options. Um, another advantage is it gives you all the graphs. So uh, if you want the graphs, great. If you don't want the graphs, you can delete them. <coughs> um, so those are three big advantages. If I'm in Hunet looking at something I like, copy paste to Excel is the quickest and easiest way to get the data into Excel. But instead of copy paste, you can just do save table. It's also fast because we're simply waiting for Hunet to make the Excel file. And the advantage of Excel looks there, gives you the heading, it gives you the graph, and these are true Excel graphs. So I can change the font, I can change the title. You know, here I didn't show you this to before, but Hunet has this copy graph. If I click on copy graph, 
Huna copies the graph, but you can't change it. I mean, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, but you cannot change ABA to Acinita factor. You cannot change any of the content. But if this is Excel, you can do whatever you want with the graph. So those are some of the main advantages of saving this as Excel. Another advantage is, is that we can use this to make uh, an automated report. I'm gonna come back to that advantage later. So, uh, good. So I said I wanted to show you two more things with antibiograms. One of them was the saving as Excel. Oh, uh, and I just thought of something else. I'm now gonna click on isolates, and I'm gonna go to specimen type, and I'm just gonna ask for urine. Okay, okay, begin analysis. And again, it's not happy because of that DBase issue. Let me exit, exit out of Hunet. And let me go to Task Manager, and let me go to this, and let me just then Task, and okay. So let me go back into Hunat, and all hospitals. But I'm using all hospitals, so then I can use all the data from all the different facilities. We we discussed that on the last call. Data analysis uh, macros bring back my gram-negative antibiograms, this time it should work. First of all, I do first isolate, well, actually I already did that, first isolate the patient, I already did that. Isolates, let me do specimen type, is urine. Okay, okay, begin analysis. So now I have exactly the same data, but all of this is now urine. So I see that I do have enough data for my E. coli and my Klebsiella, 320 isolates, 117. I just don't have enough for anything else. There were only three enterobacters, 13 pseudomonas. So a lot of people ask that they want to make a urine antibiogram or an inpatient antibiogram or an ICU antibiogram. So you can use these features to do that. Okay. The final thing about antibiograms is let me go to analysis type. So everything I did here uh, was by organism. Every row had one organism. I'm gonna change this now. Let me just get rid of, I just wanna put E. coli. Now I just have E. coli here. And urine, I want everything. So I brought all everything back. So I'm doing an antibiogram just for E. coli all by itself. This should not be a surprise to you. It is simply the same row that we've been looking at multiple times, but it is only the E. coli. Great. Now what I can do, the new thing to show you, is I can put in the rows a new variable like laboratory. Okay, begin analysis. And here you can now see that the different laboratories, of course we want to combine the 01001. 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, so now I can see laboratory one, laboratory two, laboratory three, laboratory four. This is also valuable for the national report because then you can see the differences between the different hospitals. So for example, here, hospital, laboratory one is 93% sensitive. Laboratory three was only 67% sensitive. So there's a big difference in the percent sensitive. It might be a quality control problem, it might be an outbreak, it might be a lot of resistance, or it might be because, well, look at the denominator. They only tested amicacin three times. So this laboratory tests amicacin a lot. This laboratory only tests it probably is a second line agent. So I don't believe that, I don't believe that, what is this, hospital three? The hospital three. I don't believe hospital three has 67% resistant. Uh, I'm sorry, 67% sensitive. They only tested it three times. Uh, I'm guessing that it was resistant to the first line agents, but sensitive to the second line agents. Um, so these are part of the interpretation. And then you can go back to the lab and say, can you please start testing amicacin in the future? if it is something we want to recommend at the national level. So anyway, this analysis is basically useful for benchmarking. I see, we already saw the national, now I wanna see the average for each facility separately. Let me see if I see another example of this. You have meropenem. Meropenem, 100% sensitive, 98% sensitive, 95% sensitive, but laboratory four was the smallest, 90.6% 90, 90 sensitive. How often did they test it? Imipenem, Mer meropenem, 85. So, so look, how hospital four has 90 E. coli. They tested meropenem 85 times, which is great. They almost always test meropenem. So this suggests to me that hospital four 
indeed has more resistance. Maybe they have more ICU patients. Maybe they're from an area of the country that has more resistance. Maybe they're older people. Maybe there's an outbreak. Or maybe there's a quality control problem. Imipenem is a drug that is unstable in tropical environments. But this is allowing me to see the different problems that the different laboratories may have. I'm going to continue on to something else. Any questions about this? So this is what I would call a so national a benchmark. Sorry, John, there is a question. Uh, Zilalem put a question in chat. Zilalem, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, can one identify a multi-drug resistant organism? Uh, yes, because it can. I'm asked to do that one, yeah. Good, let's come back to that. Let me finish this up. I'm going to click on continue. I do remember that EPHI, it's all laboratory one, but I'm going to put by, I think I think you called it institution. So here you see ABT, ALC, ALH. So the name of your institution is in a different column. It's in the, uh, it's in the, um, the institution column. So now I have all of the different facilities that you know that EPHI gets the most common one. Let me sort this by. Uh, let me go to the top of the list. Top of the list. So the number one is hospital TAS, followed by AS. You know, followed by 30, uh, followed by ABT. So this is a facility antibiogram done with the EPHI data. Um, I'm going to do the same thing here for the gram positives. So let me say, for example. Um, Organisms, let me put Staph aureus, Enterococcus faecalis, Enterococcus faecium, Streptococcus pneumonia, okay. Let me put all antibiotics, okay. And let me say macros, and let me say gram positive antibiogram, save, save, exit, begin analysis. And then I've got the same issue that I keep on having, so I do need to leave Hunet. And at 2020 and task was this. Oops, I guess I did not close it, or, or it just needs a little more time. Mm -hmm. Okay, who not? Okay, great. So, okay, now I go back in all hospitals, data analysis, and the second time it should work. So now I have my gram positive, and. Um, <laughs> oh, actually, that time the issue was different. I just chose the wrong file, uh, encrypted. I, I just did not. Let me go back and choose the encrypted ones. Okay, and I choose these, and I choose these, and I choose begin analysis, begin analysis. So now I have my gram positive antibiogram. Great. Oh, okay, and I, I chose the wrong one. Um, uh, I think I simply, I, I, I think I just chose the wrong one. Micro, I that's what it is. I chose the wrong macro. Staphorus, enterococcus faecalis, enterococcus faecium, streptococcus pneumonia. Okay, begin. Great, this is my gram positive antibiogram. What I'd like to show you now is a quick analysis report. Again, this is a repeat. Of, I'm going to make a new report. This new report is my antibiogram report. In there, I want to put the gram negative antibiogram followed by the gram positive antibiogram. Save, save. Exit. Let me choose my encrypted stuff. Let me choose those four files. I'm now showing you the final advantage of the Excel. Export this to Excel. It's now doing the, e the gram negative antibiogram followed by the gram positive antibiogram. So the whole idea here is to start automating it. If you are doing the same thing every time, we want this to be as simple as possible. For example, you might want to make an antibiogram. You know, separately, um, you may want to make a separate antibiogram for each of the hospitals. So you don't want to do that manually. You just want to, you know, just have it done quickly. And where's my antibiogram report? That's it. Yeah, that's it. So here I have two sheets. This is my gram negative antibiogram on the first sheet, my gram positive antibiogram on the second sheet. So this helps to, this helps you make your reports facility by facility in a simple way. Okay, I'm going to skip over that quickly. It was just this is a repeat of what we did previously about reports, but everything in a macro can be put into a report to help automation. 
Now moving on to the next topic. You've asked me two questions about multi-resistance. You asked me earlier about the imipenem and the cefoxidin, and I'll do an example. So if I want to simply choose two drugs, I do a scatter plot. I can do that with measurements, but let me start by interpretations. And let me compare, I'm not gonna put imipenem because they don't usually test imipenem. They do test meropenem. And I don't know, another drug. I could put cefoxidin, but I don't think they tested it. Let me put Cipro. So this is now a comparison. Where's my Cipro, my Cipro, there's my Cipro. I'm gonna compare the meropenem and the Cipro results. Okay, let me put E. coli and Klebsiella. Okay, data files, hopefully this will work. Let me choose all four files, begin analysis, begin analysis. And again, I've got that stupid issue. So I just, I'm gonna say this is a macro. Scatter plot, EPHI, save. I'm saving it as a macro simply so that I don't actually have to give the same answers again. Monet. Good. I go back there. Monet. And I choose Ethiopia all. And I choose data analysis. I choose my scatter plot macro. And then I choose my data files again. I remove that one and I say begin. Good. Oh, and I think I chose the wrong. I think I chose the. It's a, I chose the wrong because it's step four. It shouldn't have been. I meant to put. Well, I, the real is I don't remember what I put. The problem is when I'm. My fingers are disconnected from my brain. <laughs> so let me put. Uh, let me just put what I originally wanted to do. I'm going to put Cipro and I'm going to put imipenem or meropenem. Usually I put the older drug on the X axis and the newer drug on the Y axis. But you do whatever you want. So here I see a comparison of the two drugs. At the top of the screen, uh, it says E. coli with the number of isolates tested. I personally cannot see the number of isolates. Oh, there it is. I, I just have to move it because right now my go to meeting's in the way. So I think that's 580 or 380 isolates of E. coli. Lower left hand corner, 3% of the bacteria are resistant to both. 22% upper right are sensitive to both. The biggest category is upper left, 66, I'm gonna round that off, 67%. So 67% of the bacteria of the E. coli are ciprofloxacin resistant, but meropenem susceptible. So I, does this answer part of your question from before? This is if I have two drugs I want to compare, I do a scatter plot. This is very valuable to the pharmacy. I'm gonna choose two very similar drugs. Let me choose, um, let me choose ampicillin with amoxicillin clavulinic acid. I get my denominator at the top of the screen. There were 219. Um, good. And you see most of the bacteria are resistant to both. 62% meaning neither of the drugs is great. But which drug is better? Well, if you look in the upper left, you see 17%. 17% are ampicillin resistant, but augmentin, amoxicillin clavulinic acid is also known as augmentin, the brand name. So 17% of the bacteria are ampicillin resistant, uh, but and augmentin sensitive. That makes sense. Augmentin is a better drug. Of course, it's a better drug. It's it's augment, it's amoxicillin, ampicillin plus clavulinic acid. It's something else. I'm very happy to see nothing in the lower right hand corner of this graph. The lowest right hand corner of this graph would be ampicillin sensitive, augmentin resistant, and that's not possible. If a bacteria is augmentin resistant, it should also be ampicillin resistant. So this is useful for market biology to look at quality control. I'm very happy to see that in Ethiopia, augmentin was never better than ampicillin. It shouldn't be better than ampicillin and your data confirm that. So that makes me feel better about your data quality. I'm gonna choose a similar example. I'm gonna compare ampicillin with, with, with meropenem. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I accidentally changed the analysis. Uh, okay, and analysis type, and if I go to, I, I accidentally changed the scatter, changed, okay. Ampicillin to meropenem. 
uh, okay, and I say okay, and I say begin. So here I, again, I am very happy. I do not, lower right hand corner is empty. The lower right hand corner would be meropenem resistant, ampicillin sensitive. That's not possible. If a bacteria is resistant to meropenem, it should also be resistant to ampicillin. Unfortunately, a lot of people do have quote unquote meropenem resistant, ampicillin sensitive, but it's simply a laboratory mistake. A common reason is that, you know, that the meropenem disc is, has gone bad. So maybe there is no meropenem. I also see this Zalalem has left the call. I don't know if, it's, if he's busy or if he has a technical issue. Um, so I was going to ask him if this answers his question, but I hope that's clear for the rest of you. This analysis is useful for quality control checking, looking for combinations that don't make sense. It's just for the pharmacy is they're trying to see which drug is better. Like meropenem and imipenem are more or less the same thing, but usually one of them is a little bit better. Or like genomycin and amicacin, amicacin is usually a lot better. Let me take a look at that. Let me compare gentamicin and amicacin. And I say, okay, I say begin analysis. So here you see in the upper right hand corner, 69% are sensitive to both drugs, meaning that both of the drugs have activity, but the genomycin isn't great. So 69% are sensitive to both. That's upper right. Upper left is 19%. 19% are genomycin resistant, but they are amicacin susceptible. So amicacin is clearly better than genomycin. In fact, it is 19% better. So, uh, so this is useful to the pharmacy. Like if amicacin were 2% better, it's not worth it. I mean, uh, they're, they're, sim they're too similar. Uh, genomycin is much cheaper, so let's keep the cheaper drug. Um, but if amicacin is 20% better, you may want to switch to amicacin as a first-line agent. You do have to keep in mind, however, that it's a reserve agent. We don't want to give reserve agents to everybody uh, because you're just wasting it for the future. So sometimes what I will recommend is if, the, if amicacin is a, is a little bit better than genomycin, use genomycin. If amicacin is much, much, much better than gentamicin, then switch to amicacin. But then a lot of times it's a bit better. It's not a lot better. It's a moderately better. And then I say, well, if it's an ICU patient, use amication. If the patient is not risk of dying, then give the genomycin because it's a cheaper drug. It's usually effective. But if the patient is at risk of dying, they're in the ICU or they're in the emergency room with sepsis, then, then amication is better. So, of course, amication is better than genomycin, but is it a little bit better or a lot better? And that will answer the question, should I use genomycin always? Should I use amicacin always? Or should I use amicacin on the sickest people where I'm concerned about the patient's life in the short-term future? If the patient's not immediately risk of dying, give genomycin, that will probably work. And if it doesn't work, then you can switch to amicacin. So these kinds of, gra this graph in front of you is valuable for helping the pharmacy make these decisions about first line and second line testing. I'm now gonna click on continue. And what I have shown you is a scatter plot using the interpretations. I'm now going to show you the scatter plot using the measurements. Okay, begin. So here you see the zone diameter. Lower, lower left, resistant to both. Upper right, sensitive to both. Top left is genomycin resistant, amicacin sensitive. But you see a lot of them have genomycin high level resistance. That's at the six millimeters at the far left. But then you also see genomycin moderate resistance. You're around 10 millimeters. So some of the bacteria are very resistant to genomycin. Some of them are moderately resistant to genomycin. So this analysis I often find useful for the infection control team as they're trying to track down an outbreak. You know, which patients have which bacteria? So top left, I see clone A. Middle left, I see clone B. Top right, I see clone C, the susceptible bacteria. Lower left, completely resistant to both. That's clone D. Uh, lower right is amicacin resistant, gentamicin sensitive. That is rare. So you have down at the bottom right hand corner of the screen is 1% is gentamicin resist, I'm sorry, is gentamicin sensitive because it's 20 millimeters but it's amication resistant because it's six millimeters. That is rare. It might be a, a laboratory mistake. 
a typing mistake, a zone, a measurement mistake, a disk mistake. Or it might be true. There, there are bacteria in the world, especially in South America, that are amication resistant, but genomycin sensitive. So that, that one in the lower right hand corner is rare. It might be a mistake or it might be true. I'm going to click on continue. So this is about looking at cross resistance between two drugs. Those two drugs might be similar, like ampicillin and augmentin, like imipenem and meropenem, or they might be very different, like oxacillin and erythromycin. Uh, look, you know, let me do that with Staph aureus. Let me compare cefoxetin, which is what we use to find our MRSA, and Cipro. So these are two completely different drugs. I'm going to put measurement. I'm going to change that to interpretations. They're completely resistant drugs, but resistance is often linked. And in fact, that's exactly what I see here. Let me see what the denial. Oh, I'm sorry, this is E. coli. I meant, so it's interesting, but I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do Staph aureus, the MRSA. Either, I, either I'm getting that error again, or I just too, too, I didn't choose two good drugs. Let me, I, I just, I, I wanna do this. Let me just choose two proper drugs. So I'm gonna do, oh, okay, no, I've got that same issue. I just have to leave on it. My apologies for this. By the end of next week, I'll aim to have that. De if we updated this to SQLite, because these files are D-based files, and that's why I have to keep on doing this. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay, all files. Well, in fact, I, I could even just, I, you know, I, I'll even just go ahead and do that to show that this is a different issue. But, you know, since it keeps on happening, uh, encrypted, looking for the word encrypted, good. Let me choose all four of those. Let me remove the other one and OK. And I'm going to just simply combine this into Ethiopia. Oh, Ethiopia all dot SQLite. Let me just make sure it says SQLite here. Yes, it does. Well, let me just type it here. Ethiopia all and save and go ahead, begin combine. So now it's combining into one big SQLite file. This routine does not use the Microsoft Access Engine. That was important because you need this feature to upgrade. Uh, so now I will stop having those that issue <laughs> that we've been having all during this session. Good, I should have done that earlier. I just didn't think of it. Okay, analysis type, what am I, what was I going to show you here? Oh, that's right. I wanted to show, um, first I want to see for Staph aureus, what are the drugs that they test? I got my SQLite, okay, begin analysis. So I remember tested. I see that they test a lot of cefoxidin and they test Cipro. So those are two reasonable drugs. So now I'm going to go to my scatter plot and I'm going to compare cefoxidin on the x axis because in the MRI, and I'm going to put Cipro on the y axis and begin. And let me do this just the interpretations, which are easier to discuss. So upper right is sensitive to both. Those are MSSA sensitive to Cipro. Lower right are our MRSA resistant to Cipro. So our MRSA are at the left side of the screen. So if I look at the left side of the screen, 10% are MRSA resistant to Cipro. Top right are 10% sensitive to Cipro. So Cipro resistance is often linked. So another way to view this is let's look at the Cipro sensitive bacteria. No, 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 another way, no. Let's look at the Cipro resistant bacteria. The Cipro resistant bacteria are in the bottom row here. So the Cipro resistant bacteria on the left, you have 10% that are oxyphoxidin resistant on the lower right, they're Cipro sensitive. Meaning that if the bacteria is resistant to Cipro, it is usually an MRSA. On the, uh, however, on the top row, Cipro sensitive, if the bacteria is sensitive to Cipro, it is usually sensitive, it's usually an MSSA. So in this facility, you know, the, M, the, the, uh, the Cipro sensitive ones are mostly MSSA and the Cipro resistant ones are mostly MRSA. So you can see that even though the bacteria, the antibiotics are completely different, different mechanisms, they are linked. You know, there's a gene, these bacteria have the gene for, they have the MECA gene for, Cipro, for MRSA resistance, but they also have a Cipro gene. It's a different gene, maybe on the chromosome, maybe on the plasmid. So by looking at cross-resistance, it helps to tell you a lot about the, um, 
a, a lot about uh, the cross resistance and the mechanisms of resistance. So Zalalim, I hope that answers part of your first question about cross resistance. Okay. I'm now gonna click on continue. Here you see percentages, 10%, 7%, 2%, gonna continue. There's this feature here called options. We're gonna go to options. So here under options, scatter plot options, I can do the percentage of isolates, I just showed you that, or I can do the number of isolates. So now if I repeat this, I don't see the percentages, I see the numbers. 12 isolates, 11 isolates, three isolates. Some people prefer the percentages, especially when the numbers are big. Some people prefer to see the numbers, especially when the numbers are small. This is one way to look at what you were asking me, is you do a scatter plot. You just choose two different drugs. Uh, let me just go, I'm going back to an isolate listing now. So I'm on the first option, isolate listing, you get analysis. Here's my listing of all of my Steph aureus. Here's a listing of all of my Steph aureus, a summary over time. You see the time here, there's some bacteria way back in, you see here, there's one isolate. If I look at the table, you see the number one here. There's one isolate from November, 2010. That's a typing mistake. That's why this graph, that graph starts in, stops, starts in 2010. Uh, I, I'm just explaining why the graph is so strange. The real data is off to the right. The other data to the far left, the data is incorrect. And the graph is by month. So the, the early months of 2010, 2011 are on the far left. The real data with the dates over to the right or over to the right. Uh, let me just change that. I don't want to show you the, to that by month. Let me show that by year. Okay, begin analysis. and summary so here you see there are a tiny number of isolates in 2010 and 2011 those were just typing mistakes most of the data are 2018 and 2019 that's that's something we've done previously isolate listing what i would like to show you now is i'm going to click on isolates and i can ask for here i'm going to go to cefoxetin i'm going to ask for cefoxetin resistant okay and I'm going to ask for ciproploxacin, wherever it is, cipro, sensitive or resistant, let me choose resistant, okay, okay, begin analysis. So these bacteria are resistant to cipro and cefoxidin. So this is another way to answer your question. So for these bacteria, um, uh, these are, so if I go to the right, if I move to the right, you'll see that cefoxidin, they're always resistant, and the Cipro is always resistant. Uh, I, I, not oxytocin, we're Cifoxidin. Cifoxidin. So the Cifoxidin is resistant and the Cipro is resistant. So there's another way to look for cross resistance. With the scatter plot, I saw everything at the same time, which is sometimes what you want. In this example, I'm only seeing things that are resistant to both. It's, and this is the summary. You asked me about multi-drug resistance. We're going to leave that for next time. This analysis is called multi-drug resistance profiles. Uh, I'm going to show you the WHO test hospital. This is a little teaser for next time. Resistance profiles by day. Okay. Aureus. Hopefully it will accept my file. Well, yeah, I'm going to choose the SQLite version of it. So this is multi-drug resistance. So let me move a little bit to the right. My mouse is not working, so I've got to use my finger. Oh, so, so these bacteria at the top are resistant to nothing. These four bacteria are resistant to one drug, erythromycin. These are resistant to one drug, penicillin. Resistant to two, resistant to three, resistant to four. Resistant at the bottom, you see uh, there are four isolates resistant to all seven drugs. And then you see they're categorized as multi-drug resistant possible extensive drug resistance. This particularly interesting example because two of them are oncology, two of them were outpatients, so maybe you know they were oncology patients who went home and then came back. Um, so this is just a little teaser for next time. This is a graph resistant to everything. At the top, resistant to nothing, resistant to one, resistant to penicillin, resistant to two. So the answer to your question is yes, when it does do multi-drug resistance, this analysis is called resistance profiles. If you want to spend time discussing this on the next call and how to choose a meaningful set of antibiotics. I'm going to exit out of Hunet. Any questions? John, this is Martin Evans. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, my question really um, refers to the frequency 
of providing antibiograms to a particular hospital. Normally, I think the practice is every year, but if you're trying to detect emerging resistance, is it not better to do it, for example, quarterly? And what has been your experience globally about how often antibiograms are provided in order to detect emerging resistance? Uh, I do not recommend antibiograms as the primary way of finding emerging resistance. There are better ways. By looking at these things over time, some of those graphs of MRSA, multi-drug resistance. So if, you're, if your interest is emerging drug resistance, antibiograms is one way, but you're just looking for change of percentage. If it goes from 75% to 70%, if you're going for 75% sensitive to 70% sensitive, the number went down. But these numbers bounce around a lot because of the small numbers or other random things. But if I saw, for example, okay, so 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 basically, yeah, if if antibiogram is one of your main strategies for finding emerging resistance, I think quarterly is good for that. It's sort of a, an early alert that something seems to be changing. But if your interest is emerging resistance, there are more sensitive and specific ways to address that question. Thank you. So in terms of antibiograms to support treatment guidelines, I suggest yearly. If you're using antibiograms as part of your strategy for emerging resistance, then quarterly would make sense for that. But I would do that, I would not do that by itself. I would do that plus other things that are more specific, such as these graphs, month to month or quarter to quarter. Okay. Other questions? Uh, uh, I, I did show you how to do an antibiogram uh, by by laboratory. You saw the different rows, laboratory one, laboratory two, laboratory three. I could have done that by year or by quarter as well. So in fact, I could have asked for an antibiogram, not by laboratory, I could have asked for an antibiogram by quarter. The problem with antibiograms by quarter is the numbers get very small. Um, some people, what they like to do is they do a rolling 12 months. So they'll so for in January they'll do the previous four quarters. In April they'll do the previous four quarters. July they'll do the previous four quarters. Is what we call a rolling antibiogram. So you're always using 12 months, but you just update which 12 months you're talking about. 